Okay. Good morning. Welcome back, everybody. So those who came an hour ago, the show is actually starting now. Um, but uh, we are back. So we've had a little bit of a break, break for the Chagim. The truth is before the Chagim, we had Sharon, we changed topic a little bit. Shana Yom Kippur, hard to believe that it's all over, but uh, for another year. But here we go. We're back to our regular, nothing like Kfiyot of Limud Torah. We're back to our regular schedule, learning Hilchot Shabbat. Which uh, you'll be pleased to know there is an entire week until the next one. So uh, for a change, <laughs> that's a nice, uh, that's a nice change. Um, okay, I just remind everybody we're on volume eighteen. I remind everybody that the volumes can be purchased if you would like from the shul. I think it's sixty shekels a copy. Um, there are also sponsorship ava- opportunities available for future volumes. So bear that in mind. Okay, page number fifty-four. We, be, we were in the midst of discussing Yilchot Bishul. Obviously, there's a lot to unpack and a lot to get our heads around in terms of Yilchot Bishul, different things. Um, we spoke about the kinds of Kli Rishon, Kli Sheni, Kli Shishi, which may or may not exist, right? On the fire, off the fire, heat, Yatzolet, Po, etc. We pick up with a sugya of Megis. Very, very interesting uh, shine. It's actually very, very practical and very relevant. It comes up all the time, especially if, let's say, for example, you go away for Shabbat, Right, you go to a hotel or something like that. And generally, I've yet to see a hotel where this isn't the case. But talking about the Mahadran hotels and everything, you go, it's time to get your food. You go to the buffet and all the food is there on hot plates. Right, They don't take the food off the hot plate. And then you take your food or while the food, which is cooked, presumably, but you're taking off the food. Is that a problem? Is that permitted? Not so simple. Not so simple. So let's uh, try and unpack see what the potential problems could be in that and how we and how we get around it. So we begin with the sugya of Megis. Page 54, source number 62. For those that are watching on Zoom or on YouTube later on, you're going to have to have the book open in front of you as well. Um, unfortunately, we aren't able to sync it with the, with the video. But source number 62. So this is the Gemara Beitza. So the Gemara here says, Tanya, echad mevita u, vechad mevita itzim, vechad shofet etak dera, vechad mevita mai, vechad noten betuchot tavlin, vechad megis, Kulan Chayavim. Okay. The Gemara here is showing how you can have different people who can all participate in a single act of cooking on Shabbat. Each one contributes in a way that contributes towards the cooking, and each one will therefore be liable. So one person brings the fire, one brings the wood, one puts the pot on the stove, one puts the, places the water, one puts the spices, one stirs the pot. All of them are going to be Chayav for a Bishel. Now, the Gemara does point out that if all of this was done, if all of this was done and the fire had not been lit, Right, and the last action is lighting the fire. So then it's only the one who's lit, who lit the fire who's going to be chayef. But assuming how that is not the case, the fire was set first. And now what, what uh, interests us is the last one, right? Echad megis kulan chayavin. One who stirs the pot is going to be chayef. Chayef for, presumably, the, the melacha of bishul. And therefore we see that stirring a food, stirring a food is going to be part of, that is an action which, which is going to uh, increase or is going to bring about, expedite the cooking process, and that in itself is considered cooking. We've still not discussed yet two things, two points to mention. One, at the moment, we're talking about stirring. We're not talking about removing the food from the pot. Okay, so let's not get confused, but we'll get to that as well. Talking about the actual stirring as well. And But what exactly is the case? Here, clearly, the Gemara is talking about a case where it's on the fire and the food is not yet cooked. What will be the case if the food is cooked? What will be the case if it's off the fire? Okay, that we will that we will discuss. But that is our starting point: is to say that there is such a thing. Megis is part of the malacha of Bishul. Now we have another Gemara in Masechet Shabbat. It's not actually talking about cooking. How the Gemara is talking about when you have dyes, right? You have these hot dyes, these wool in a in a pot of hot dyes on the fire on Shabbat, um, and the question over there. This is uh, going through a set of machlokot between Beit Hila and Beit Shammai about shvi- regarding Shvitat Kalim, whereby if I just leave it in the pot on Shabbat, am I going to be uh, liable for a uh, melacha or not? Or is there going to be any Sudra Banan in doing that? So we see that uh, Beit Hillel, what comes up, right, you see here in the introduction, they've brought the whole, it's a long sugya. But Beit Hillel, we're not concerned that one may come to stir the pot and transgress the prohibition. So the Gemara here explains, talking about a very specific case. Because the Mara says, let us uh, make a gzera that if you have this wool inside the dye's kettle, we're worried a person's going to come and maybe stoke the coals or that a person might come and stir it. So Mashmua, akura. It says, okay, no, the case is where Beit Hillel permitted 
again, it's not, it's not, it's not directly our discussion now, but the case is where the pot was removed from the fire. And if the pot is removed from the fire, there's no concern. I'm going to stoke the coals underneath the pot because it's not on it. So says the Gemara, okay, well, let's be concerned. Maybe you will come to a uh, stir. So the answer is, no, not only here is the case whereby the pot has been removed, but the pot has also been sealed with clay. And you cannot open it. So there's no way that you will come to stir it. So, but what you see from here is the following. You see that if there is a concern that there could be a Gzerad Rabbanan that you're going to come to do Megis, it would only be a Gzerad Rabbanan if we're dealing with an Yisor Doraita. The Yisor Doraita is Megis, that is the Yisor of stirring. Now, interestingly, the, the case of Yaz was Akura Vetucha. Not only, it's not enough that it's removed from the fire, but also that it has to be sealed. In other words, we can infer from here that, and this is what Rashi is going to suggest, we can infer from here that even when the pot is not on the fire, I'm concerned that there could be a there could be an isur of megis. And so what melacha would it be? So Rashi writes that the melacha would be bishul. Rashi writes the melacha is bishul. You'll see in footnote number 54 that Tosfor and the Ramba and the Ramban disagree. They say over here we're dealing with Tsover. We're not dealing with bishul. Mm -hmm. Why is it? Why would that why, say? Why would that why would they argue that? Possibly because the case here we're dealing with in the Gemara is whereby. It, the, the, where it's not on the fire. So if it's not on the fire, that, that's our first machloket. I have now uncooked food. It's in a pot that is not on the fire. If I come along and stir it, am I, am I now violating the prohibition of Bishul or not? According to Rashi, it would seem to be yes. According to Tosfot, it would seem to be no. What's the machloket between them? Machloket between them might be when I, come to stir, when I come to stir the food and I'm going to come to cook, how is the food being cooked? One might say, if I'm stirring the food and at parts that are not, that have not been closer to the fire, and I, those are going to be cooked, being cooked from the heat of the fire. Another opinion might say, and again, we've seen similar ideas to this in the past, you might say that parts of the food are cooked and parts of the food are not cooked and you're stirring it around, it's being cooked from the, from the heat of the food, which is in the pot, but we've discussed clearly, etc. Yeah. If you're talking about it with the wool, you're talking about hot water. It's already, it's already been on the fire. For sure, it's been on the fire, correct. And it's hot. And, and, and it's hot. If the whole thing is cold, so there's nothing to talk about. Right. For sure, that's not an issue. But our question is, if I have uncooked food that is hot, that is currently... Everybody agrees on this. If I have uncooked food that is on the fire and I stir it, that is going to be so the writer, that is my use. What happens if that is still hot, but it's been removed from the fire and I now come to stir it? Is that still going to be a prohibition? According to Rashi, yes. According to other Rishonim. Don't, don't you have to step, take a step back? Don't you have yeah. to go, no, because it, I mean, all this is based on whether or not it's cold so cold or not. Like if we're talking about maybe a piece less cooked, maybe you have a problem to begin with. So we'll get to that. We'll get to that. That's a good, that's a good point. We'll get there very, very soon, whether it's cooked or not. But certainly we're, we're dealing with a case where the food, where the food is uncooked. That's how, that, that, right. I agree. That's our, that's our starting point. Our starting point here is that the food is not cooked. Have a look at the run. The run in source number 64. Top of the next page. He says, right, it's what we just what we just said, that even though it's currently not on the fire, again, it's still hot, otherwise there's nothing to talk about, but it's not currently on the fire, it's still Megis. So the run goes even further. The run says, not even... If it's fully cooked, but if it's reached Mahal ben Rosai, we saw previously there's Machloka. What happens when I have food that is Mahal ben Rosai and I cook it further? Right? Mahal ben Rosai is either half cooked or third cooked, and, and, I, uh, and I cook it further. The Ran says if it's reached that level, then that's enough. Then there is no more, no more cooking anymore. Okay. However, where does everything get a little bit sticky? Is the Kobo. The Kobo on source number 65, one of the Rishonim, he says, and listen to this, he says, Kaimalan. He says, even if the food is cooked and I now come along and start stirring it in the pot, that is still going to be an issue. That's still going to be a prohibition. Notice he says, when it's on the fire. Well, the next question we'll ask is, what if you have cooked food that's been taken off the fire? Is there reason to be machmer over there? We'll see there are those who are machmer. Again, you can find somebody to be machmer for, for, for everything. No less than there are ma, however. So it's not a, it's not a, it's not a, a uh, chumrah mufrechet, but we'll discuss it. We'll explain. But the first question is, why does he say, I don't understand. If the point is, again, let's take a step back. Why are we saying, we have a melacha from the Torah, we have a melacha of cooking. 
What is cooking? Cooking is you take raw food, you put it on the fire, you whatever it is. You do anything that's going to expedite the cooking process. I'm going to stir the food because I have a very, very big pot and the food that's on top isn't reaching the heat and that's not going to get cooked. Okay, I can understand. If the entire pot is already cooked, and this is what the corpo is telling me, the entire pot is already cooked, but you come along and you stir, that is still going to be an issue. Why? Does it make a difference if it's dry versus wet? It's a pot. It's a pot. It's dry versus wet. Because if you put a piece of meat on a pot and you're stirring it, it's not, there's no, it's no liquid in it. Versus where you do have liquid in it. So that maybe comes to that maybe comes to a discussion we'll see later on in terms of bishul acharafiyah different different types of cooking. Okay, maybe 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 there's a relation there. Yeah, you want to say something? No. Okay, so What's the basis for the kolbo saying that it's still cooking. What is what, what is he concerned about? Well, that's exactly what we're asking. That's what that, that's what doesn't seem to make sense. We understand from the Gemara that there is an issue of magis, which is part of the process of bishul. Okay, right, we were saying that if when you stir the food, that is going to expedite the cooking process. The Gemara doesn't say anything more than that. Kolbo says, okay, we have to be concerned for this, even when the food is cooked. And the question we're asking is why? Why should we be concerned? The food is cooked. You're going to expedite the cooking of cooked food. We've already learned. We have a principle. Ain bishul, like our bishul. Right, so why should, it, why should that be the case? So says the Prima Gadim, the Prima Gadim in source number 66, he says, Afel gave the Ain Bishulach Abishul. He says, You're right. You've come to the previous Shirem. You remember what we learned. We said, Ain Bishulach Abishul. But Hagasa po elet yote. Shkoyach. What does that, what, what, what does that mean? It doesn't, doesn't tell me anything. He says that the stirring has more of an effect. I don't know. Again, very, very, very strange. The Sharat Siyum, which you remember, the Sharat Siyum is written by the Chofetz Chaim. Right? The Mishnah Brura has the three different Sfarim on the same page. We have the Mishnah Brura, which goes according to the order of the Shulchan Aruch. We have the Biyor Alacha, which is generally speaking, when you have a sugya that's a little bit more complicated or maybe different opinions, and he goes a little bit more in depth, he writes that there. And then at the bottom of the page, we have the Sharat Siyun. The Sharat Siyun generally just brings the Makorot, brings the sources that the Chavetz Chaim brings in the, in the uh, Mishnah Bura. Sometimes, by the way, you'll see that he writes, the source is, pos, he writes one word, he writes Poskin or Achronin, right? Um, many times when the Shara Tzion just writes Poskim or Achronim, he's actually referring to himself. So, but uh, that's uh, but sometimes in the Shara Tzion there, he does add a little a little bit of uh, explanation as well. And this is one of those cases. So he says, yeah, relating to this Prima Gadim, he says, I don't understand. And how can, again, if we say that stirring is part of, it's a component of cooking, how can you say that stirring itself is going to be on page 55, that stirring is more stringent than the actual process of cooking. Right? Excuse me. Everybody agrees that when you have something which is fully cooked, certainly if it's solid, it's fully cooked, you would, there is no more bishul, no more cooking. Yeah, we have so said explicitly. So he says, therefore, certainly, and it's important to know, he says, Bediyeved, there would be no, there would be no prohibition. If somebody came along and stirred the, even if we're going to be choshesh for the stringency, somebody came along and stirred the food, right? You can come and you can still eat it. We don't consider that like, for example, somebody came and cooked food when a katkhil on Shabbat, not for a sick person, not for that, whatever. Somebody just came, they didn't know or they did know and they willfully transgressed and cooked. Very complicated, uh, uh, discussion over there it, it, in terms of exactly what the parameters are, but there will be limitations on whether, who, and how, and when you can eat that food on Shabbat. But if this was just done and was stirred, says the Sharat Zion, no problem, at least, but ever. But we still haven't answered the question. Where does the Kobo get the stringency from? Again, the Kobo told us that if you stir food, which is fully cooked, which is on the fire, that is a that is a prohibition because you are cooking, but the food's already cooked. Okay, so Rav Moshe Feinstein, turn over the page, page 56, in uh, Igros Moshe has a, has a suggestion. And he says the following. He says, Ika ktsata. Again, ktsata, right? This, 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 is, uh, this is difficult. But nonetheless, even though the pot has been cooked, it's been fully cooked. So you will have small bits of food, right? Imagine you have a, think you have a bigger pot of cholent or whatever it is. There's bits that are not going to get, there's bits that are not cooked. 
right? If you want to know, if you want to find out, you know, which are the bits and are there bits that are not cooked, you know, get a, get a young kid to come along and give it on the plate. He will find exactly, you know, they can be the tiniest suspect that, ah, this isn't cooked, right? They'll, they'll find it for you. But so he says, you look at this part, overall, the pot is cooked, it's ready, it's like, but it's, you know, there's going to be little bits here and there that they won't cook. I look at the pot. How do I judge? And I say, it's cooked. There's a tiny piece. We know throughout the Torah, we say, bitul barov, whatever it is. Okay. Okay. So stirring, yes, sometimes there are bits that are, not, that are, that are somewhere in there that's not cooked. That's going to come along and that's going to so cook. Because that, 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 that. that. that would be the only way you could explain. Huh? Right, the only problem is that it undermines the whole edifice because then you have a situation where there's nothing like, there is no such thing as being the Bushal Once you say there's yeah. always something there for that, then there's nothing, right? Like, I mean, you completely undermine right. the structure. Right. So maybe what he's saying, so maybe what he's saying is this. He's saying that essentially what we're saying is that is that uh, stir, when I come along and I stir the food, okay, it's a different form or it's a different, it's a different method of cooking. Maybe it's something where we know that we have, for example, we have bishul, which is generally speaking, which is where you cook via liquid, right? Boiling water, you're boiling, or it's like, let's just say it's boiling. You have roasting, you have baking, you have different different things. We will see the discussion later on about whether there is bishul acharafia or not. So the poskim discuss, maybe when the food has been cooked, you know, one way, it, it's been baked, and now I cook it, or now I roast it, or whatever it is. It adds a certain, a, a different element. It adds a certain flavor, or enhances the food in a way that it wasn't that it wasn't cooked before. So you could suggest, okay, again, and it seems like it, it is. It does sound a bit of a stretch, and as I said, it is a minority opinion, yeah. But we are, uh, we, we we do find the poskim more concerned for it, for the scoreboard. You could say that the stirring again, it's going to cause the food to be cooked in a way, or it's going to cause parts of the food to be cooked in a way that would not have been done otherwise. That seems to be that seems to be what, what is behind. But okay. Doesn't necessarily agree with you. Huh? He's giving justification, but he doesn't necessarily he doesn't say I agree with you. Right. So yeah. So so we'd have to look at we'd have to look at the full uh, at, at the full chiva over there. I don't I don't recall found exactly how he how he rules, but we'll see yeah. in a moment. The shulchan aruch and, and the Rama. Okay. But the, so so that is the first point. So just to summarize until this point. Sorry. Yes. Just to clarify, my head yeah. cooked. Yes. Fully cooked. Yes. Does, does that mean edible? Does it mean if the beans are a little tougher in the chowan than soft, soft, that if I stir, I'm cooking? Because I could eat it one way or the other way. Right, right. So, so especially with foods like cholent, etc., it gets very difficult to define exactly when do we say fully cooked or not. There's another concept which we'll come to. Oh, I believe that's precisely it. In other words, yeah. He talks about more cooked. What does that mean? That's right. Like something right. That they pass the so, bar, so we not. will come to this, and this is going to be very relevant when we get to the Surah Darabanan in terms of Shia and Chazara, etc. What we call mitztamek veralo, mitztamek viafelo, meaning there's a concept in the Gemara where you have a food which is fully cooked, but the longer that is left on the fire, the better it gets. Right, Charles is going to be the is going to be the classic example if it's for too long and the meat dries out, etc. Okay, but we, again, we generally assume that the, in the stages of cooking, we assume there is a stage what's called machal ben drosai, which is either half cooked or third cooked, which is you could eat it, but it's not cooked. Right, everybody knows there's such a that you know you eat the food, I, I can eat it, but it's not cooked. There is a stage where I say it's fully cooked, even though it could be cooked more, and even though it might get better, but it's cooked. Oh, yeah, it tastes right. And then you get to the stage of what's called mitzamek viafelo, which means if I leave it on, the fire will get better. Here we're dealing with the stage which is uh, fully cooked. So what Ramosh is saying is that even though it's fully cooked, there might be bits and pieces here and there that actually are not cooked, and therefore that's what the that's what the stirring is going not to achieve. Less cooked, huh? Not cooked or less cooked? Right. Because right. 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 the last Again. thing he's saying, it's not cooked. I agree. He says. I mean, yes, you can, Again, like he says, kretin. kretin means a tiny, tiny piece. The lonit pashlu kotzokan. There's a bean in there that hasn't been cooked. Okay. okay. So let, let, let's just summarize up to this point. So essentially, what, what we're saying is this what we understand is the following. We have the Gemara tells us that the, we have what's called megis. Megis means stirring. If I stir a pot of food, that is expediting the cooking process. And therefore, that is forbidden. Again, at default, I have uncooked food that's on the fire. I may not stir it. That is forbidden according to everybody. Question number one. If the food is hot and uncooked and I remove it from the fire, can I still? is there still a prohibition of stirring? That's a machloket. Rashi says, yes, it's forbidden. Tosfot says, it's, it's permitted. Okay, that's machloket number one. Machloket number two. 
anyway when shabbos begins. It's supposed to be what more than fifty percent cooked. At least. But that, again, again, that's that's you, you, again. You're jumping the gun. That, that we're going to talk about in future shirim. The reason is from on a, because we'll put it like this. That's when we get to the shirei drabanan of shehiyah on a Torah level, right? A, from a Torah perspective, if I have food which is completely uncooked and is put on the fire before Shabbat, biblically, mina Torah, midora. Again, I'm not saying you should do this. Don't do this. There are very good reasons why not to do it. But on a Torah level, okay. Soldiers now in Lebanon, the Torah Chayyan. Okay, and they have their food and just before Shabbat. They didn't have time to cook or whatever they need to eat. So, okay, they're going to leave their food on there. From a Torah level, have you done? Have you have you performed any melacha by leaving the food that is uncooked, hundred percent uncooked, hundred percent raw, on the fire before Shabbat? No, I haven't done anything. In in truth, there are going to be situations where we will allow. We'll see it later on. Situations where we'll allow one to leave raw food and cook on the fire before Shabbat. We have to know how and when, and when to do it. But I haven't I haven't done anything on a Torah level. There are banan. There may be there may be problems. It's only when I am actively doing something. I'm putting the food on the fire. I'm stirring and I'm moving and I'm that, that that's the only time that biblically I can be potentially violating the the malacha of Bishul on Shabbat. Again, the Rabbanan added all sorts of safeguards which we haven't gotten to. We've been talking about to, uh, Bishul the writer first, and then we'll get to Bishul the Rabbanan. But okay, so again, so if I therefore have this food which is not cooked. And I stir it on the fire, according to everybody, that's forbidden. If I take it off the fire and I stir it, according to some, that is forbidden. Okay, and according to others. What if the food is fully cooked? So I have the pot which is fully cooked, which is on the fire. Am I allowed to stir it? We would have thought, yes. And many of the Rishonim say, yes. But the Kolbo comes along and ruins everything for us. And he says, no. Okay, that is, so that is stage number one. That is the, uh, and, and we saw why, we saw not everybody understands, not everybody accepts the Shumra, but it exists. Okay, that is stirring, that is minkis. Now, the next thing the post can talk about is, if I'm concerned that when you're going to stir the pot, okay, so what happens if I take a ladle or I take a spoon, a large spoon, right, and I want to get the cholent out, and what happens? When I start serving it, I inadvertently or purposefully, I'm not just taking the food out, but I'm actually mixing it, I'm stirring it as well. Do I need to be concerned that when I when I take out the food with a spoon or with a ladle, either that I'm actually going to be stirring, or do I say maybe that rubber, and this is a logical thing, because if you're going to take the food out of the ladle, many times the first thing you'll do is you want to stir it. You have the big pot of chon and all the meats on the top and all the potatoes are at the bottom. And I like potatoes and I don't like meat. Okay, I'm strapped, right? So 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 what am I going to do? I'm going to go and I'm going to stir it first. So maybe there's a xerad rabbanan that says if you're going to pour, if you're going to pour out with a spoon, you're going to come to uh, so don't pour out with a spoon so that you won't come to uh, so that you won't come to stir. It. Okay, again. Taking out with a spoon, our default position is going to say that taking out with a spoon or ladling, as they as they write here on page 56, that in itself is probably not going to be an Isudor writer, but that might be an Isudor banana that is related to the prohibition of stirring. So let's see the Rambam. The Rambam in source number 69 says, Asur vihi al ha'esh menu he says, you're going to take your big spoon or your ladle. You're going to put it into the pot. Again, notice, which is on the fire on Shabbat. He says, you can't do that. Because that is part of stirring. Okay, the Rambam says, you're going to find lots and lots and lots of discussion amongst the, amongst the commentaries. So he says, this is like cooking on Shabbat. So notice, it's not exactly the same as Megis. It is kimavasha. It's a lie cooking. So many of them of Farshim say, yeah, that according to the Rambam, this is going to be an Isu de Rabbanan. Right? Again, if I we assume that we're dealing with uncooked food that's on the fire, if I'm stirring it, that is an Isu de Raita, according to everybody. If I take it out now with a spoon, so that is going to be seemingly an Isu de Rabbanan. So says the Rambam. Says the Rivet. Okay? It says, he frizz on mirotav. If anybody would talk about the Rambam today, the way the Ravid used to talk about it, they'd probably put them in hair. But that was the, that was the way that they argued. He says, the, the, the Ravid says, that's ridiculous. He says, the Rambam doesn't know what he's talking about. He says, he's gone over the top. What do you mean? If for some of the time he says, he's been crazy. He says, come on, says, Rambam, right? This is, a, we, know, we know how this goes. The Gemara said, you can't stir. Now you're telling me you can't take out with a spoon? No. So according to the Ravid, just taking out, serving, ladling, taking out with a spoon. There is no prohibition whatsoever. Okay. We find 
By the way, we find a third opinion that's maybe a little bit more stringent, and you, you can infer this from the Shulchan Aruch. Have a look, 71. The Shulchan Aruch says, So you have these big pots, uh, uh, and like there are these large pots they had in the days of the Gemara. Now you've taken it off the fire. Again, if it's not, if the food inside is not fully cooked. He says, you cannot, uh, you cannot uh, take out with a spoon the food because you are stirring. Okay, you could, if you look in the Beit Yosef and you look at the, the way the, the Shulchan Aruch, the way that he uh, writes it, seems to imply a little bit more stringent than the Rambam. I mean, not that this is like cooking, but that this is cooking itself, might even be an Isodo writer. It says, bashel. This is cooking. However, if it is if, if it is fully cooked, then it is allowed. How do you know the spoon cook was consuming? <laughs> <laughs> Generally speaking, generally speaking, you know you can tell if the food is uh, uh, if the food is cooked. Um, if I don't know what being, in other words, like he's saying, because he doesn't really to differentiate. The only reason he's concerned in the first place is because it's not really shot cold sofa, right? So it's not just like he's just saying essentially, like yeah, because this is what we're worried about. If you know that that's not a problem, then it's probably not concerned either. Right, right. What does it mean to remove? I was under the impression that let's say you want something, you take it off the platter. But if you're still holding it, you can take something out as long as you're holding it. You cannot put it down and, and then start, but you can still put it back. So so, so again, you, you're talking about the question of whether you can take the pot now and put it back on the fire or take it off the fire. If you're that's, still holding it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We haven't, we haven't, we haven't touched that yet because that's all this sort of And we'll get there. We'll get there. Uh, but right now we're talking about removing the food from the, removing the food from the pot itself. So again. Could there be a difference in kavana? If I'm stirring, my kavana is to stir it up. Whereas if I'm removing the food from the pot, I have, don't have kabana to stir. I just want to take the food out and put it on my plate. Right. So that's what the rivet says. The rivet says if you're just taking the food out. Because of kabana, is that what he's saying? The differences in kabana, what your intention is? I think it's one that because he, he says under any case, even if you have kabana one or the other, it's ridiculous. Like he's saying there's no wouldn't do that. Like it doesn't function. Like I think it's a blanket. I think I, I think I think the difference is the difference here is, is what you're doing. Meaning, if I put, if I stick a spoon now into the in, into the pot, if I'm stirring, it's kind of stirring. If I'm just removing the thing, so the, the, so so the rabbit would say, if I'm just, why is taking up, stirring itself? He's saying, is it related to is it related to cover now? I think it's both. It's related to the action and what you intend to do. Um, certainly, if the food certainly if the food is fully cooked. Right, the the rivet will definitely tell you, and maybe even the Rambam would say that there's no. Because uh, what, what 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 did the Rambam say? He said, um, right. I think that they would. Right, I think they would agree that if the food is or is already cooked, so then the Shulchan Aruch was the one who said it explicitly. Right, he said him lo nit bashel kolso in seventy one. Shulchan Aruch said him lo nit bashel kolso ko. In other words, if it is then there's no then there's no reason to be machmer. There's no reason to be machmer in terms of taking it uh, taking it out taking it out with the spoon. Huh? Yeah, 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 for sure. If it's uncooked, if it's uncooked food, then that's going to be a problem. If the food is cooked, we're saying then there's no issue. Okay, so let's. So hang on. So let, let, let's just summarize again until this point because there's, there's a number of parameters here, moving parts, and then we'll get to we'll get we'll get to the next stage. So again, our starting point was all of this is based on megis. All of this is based on stirring. Stirring the food is part of the bishul. So if I'm stirring and cook food that's on the fire, that is going to be prohibited. That is going to be essentially like cooking. Question is, do I now extend that either midoraita or midrabanan? Do I say that when I'm taking food out of the pot that I may come to stir? Right. So essentially, the Rambam says, if the pot's on the fire and the food is not cooked, I'm concerned that when I when I take the food out, that I'm going to end up uh, maybe that I, maybe that I'll end up stirring, and therefore I should not do that. The rivet says I have no issue. The only issue I have is when you are actually stirring. If you're not stirring, so then you can take out the food. You can do whatever you want. The Shulchan Aruch said the Shulchan Aruch said that even if the food is off the fire but it's not cooked. I can, um, even if it's off the fire, but it's not cooked, then I cannot take it out because 
that is like stirring. Um, what would be the case? What would be the case if it's off the fire, but it's cooked? So then there's, then, then, then there's no issue. What would be the case if it's on the fire and it's already cooked? That the Shulchan Aruch is not is not is not clear about that, and that's going to be the main the main question. That's the question we started off with, right? You go to the hotels, you go to all these places. I have the food, I have the big giant the massive hot plates, whatever, and I have the pot of cholent or schnitzel or whatever it is. Take your pick, whatever potatoes, I don't know, whatever rice, whatever you like to eat in Shabbat, right? If I'm taking out with a spoon, the, again, so the food is cooked, but it's on the fire. Okay, so I'm not so to stir it. Would still be, we can see there's still be an issue. That would be the the uh, the uh, stringency of the kobo. But if it's just taking it out and not stirring it, seemingly on the Shulchan Aruch, that should be okay. Let's see. The Rama over here yeah, goes a little bit further. The Rama is a little bit more stringent. Source number 72. He says, The Rama here has a tremendous, tremendous Chumra. We're going to see, none, the Achronim do not accept the, the, the Chumra of the Rama because he, the Rama is essentially saying, not only do we take the Khumra of the Kobo that says even if the food is cooked, you can't stir it. He says, even wh whatever the case, you can't, if, the, if it's on the fire, you can't come along and, uh, and uh, or, or anytime that it's hot, essentially. He says, you can't take it out with a spoon. You would have to pour it into maybe a cliche ni or a cliche ni in, in order to take it out. So that is a tremendous Khumra. The Mishnah Barah says, we aren't going to be that stringent. 73. He says, according to the Ramah, what you would have to do he explains. He says, He says, any time that you come and take out with a spoon, take out with a ladle from the pot, that's going to be either you are stirring or we're concerned you're stirring or whatever it is, and you'd have to re rather pour it from one pot into another. He says, He says, we don't, we don't follow that. We don't follow that stringency. He says, why? Really, if I'm dealing with cooked food, even stirring it should be okay. It's only the Kobo who said that you can't. So to now add Chumra al Gabay Chumra that we're not going to we're not going to be worried about. You want to be from and you want to have a Chumra. So don't stir. Okay? That's don't stir. Lots of that. Bottom line, says the Mishnah Baran. Everybody agrees on this. Okay? Everybody except the Ramah. Everybody sends the Ramah. That to take out the food. From your pot with your ladle, whatever. If it's if it's fully cooked and it's not on the fire, we're not going to be stringent on that. Okay. Again, our question is if it's fully cooked but it's still on the fire. So that's what the Kobo said. We need to be stringent in terms of stirring. Does that mean we have to extend the stringency to in terms of taking it out as well? So have a look in source number seventy four. He says. <laughs> Okay, fine. That's the previous case. Now in Bob. Benit Bashel Kotsoko. Food which is fully cooked. Afilo Omeda Gabea Ur. When it's on the fire. Mutar Lotzi Bakaf Ken Mashon Beit Yosef. So according to the Beit Yosef, according to the Shulchan Aruch, it sounds like that would be permitted. Again, permitted to, to take out food with a spoon that's on the fire when it's fully cooked. Aval Bel Yarabah Masik Tishle Sobaze. However, the and Yaraba is uh, going to be stringent. So we have a machloket. And what comes out of this at the end of the day is that, first of all, we have machloket, yeah, really, Sfarim and Ashkenazim. According to the Shulchan, according to Shulchan Aruch, there is no issue. According to the Ashkenazim, based on the Ramah, again, we don't accept, we don't accept the Chumrah of the Ramah all the way to say that even if the food's been taken off the fire, you can't, you can't take it out with a spoon. But if it's on the fire, we're going to see the Poskim say, that one should be machmer if you can, if you can, unless there's reasons, there's reasons why you can't. For example, the pot's very heavy, or you're not going to, if the only way that I could take it out means that I'm going to now take, have to take the pot off the fire and put it down on the counter, and then I can take it out. But then I can't put it back, right? That's what I said. So then we'll say, the Chazonish, right? And, and others say, okay, no, in that case, rather better to take it out while it's on the fire rather than rather than taking it off. Have a look at Rav Avad, yeah? Source number 76. He says, is right? He says, one can, in case you didn't know, right? He says, one can take a, a ladle or a spoon to take the food out on Shabbat when it is fully cooked. Even when the food is on the, even when it's on the fire. 
שיש צורך להשאיר קטרת תבשיל האש. אוקיי, so he says, yeah, he writes here when there is a need, but again, most of the Sephardi Poskim say, even if there's no need, the Ashkenazi Poskim will say, if there is a need, then you, then you can do it. And that is why, Lamai said, I think this is what really what people rely on, as I mentioned at the beginning. You go to a hotel, I've never been to a hotel on Shabbat where they don't do this. I mean, the food is there, it's on, it's on the hot plates, it's on the trays, on the, even the Mahajan hotels, whatever, and everybody comes and everybody takes their food and there's no, there's no issue. Why? Because it's not practical, it's not possible to do. We're saying, again, you shouldn't stand there with a spoon and go and start stirring all the food. That you shouldn't do. But to go and just take out your, your spoon of rice or a spoon of cholent or a spoon of meat, whatever it is, that is going to be allowed Okay, there is another leniency which we can add to this. Somebody asked before, but if it's applies to solid food or liquid food, etc. So have a look at uh, source number 77, Chutchanin, Rav Karelitz. He says, That which they were stringent about there. He says, Notice that in all the poskim, it says, if you take the food out with a spoon, Nobody spoke about taking it out with a fork. If I'm taking a fork and taking out a piece of meat or a piece of schnitzel, there's no stirring that's taking place, right? With a spoon, you can go and you can stir the food. With a fork, there was no, uh, there was no exerad, there's no isur. Obviously, if you take a fork and you start stirring, even though the fork is not intended for stirring, if you go and you start stirring, that would be that you should not. He says number seventy-eight as well. We're dealing with a type of uh, type of food that if you're going to go and uh, uh, stir it. So there's parts of the food which were, which were not uh, receiving the same amount of heat. Interesting. Now, this is, this is quite a cooler. But he says, When it comes to a liquid food, there is, in fact, no prohibition of stirring. Right? If you have a pot of soup that's on the, that's on the stove, so all the, it's all going to get heated uh, equally. It's not like the cholent when the bottom gets heated, the top doesn't get heated, etc. One other thing, yeah, the bottom... Um writes, if you have a, a solid food, you know, a like kugel, etc. Um again, there where you where you're taking out the piece, you're not increasing the heat in any other part of the food, so that would be so that would be okay. All right. This so you can give by soup. You can reel it out on while it's still on the pan. No, so so what, 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 what does he say over here? I mean he seems he seems to be, he says again. Um, yeah, the question is often often you have solid pieces within the food, so then that's going to be that's going to be a problem. But he see, he seems to say that if you have soup that is clear liquid, that's all that's all that there is, then uh, then the prohibition does not does not does not seem to apply. That's uh, okay. Again, in the hotels, etc. I think that that's what they rely on. The general practice at home, etc., is that one would, uh, would take it. Why we like having mean, a sheet that like so many levels removed from it? Like, it's not even yeah. a noble flame, right? Like, you know, with these platforms, right. even the healthy, like, not to be at someone in the boat, whatever. Like, you're not even really at the point where you're actually cooking. You're just like, of course, you're keeping it warm. Like to begin with, like I mean, like aren't you really so far removed from even having these concerns? So really right, so, so we are, and again, this gets to the topic which we're going to get to in the next in the next couple of shirim. In terms of what I mentioned before, in terms of when you have the food that's when you put the food on the hot plate before Shabbat, it's always a good idea to make sure that your soup is is fully fully cooked for sure, right. but that it's that it's boiling before you put it on the hot plate before Shabbat. The reason for that is because. Once it's then and it's already, and it's already cooked, so any action that I might do on Shabbat, I might end up moving it from one side of the hot plate to another. I might do something which could, you know, speed up the cooking process. If the food was not fully cooked before Shabbat, so that's gonna that, that's gonna be a problem. And that's why, again, in terms of good practice, is always take the pot of soup, you know, off the hot plate before we start serving it up. That way, you're not gonna get into you're not gonna get into any problems. But you're correct in that a lot of these issues that we're dealing with, we're dealing with chumra al gabei chumra al gabei chumra. Again, just to summarize. The only issue that we're talking about is when I have uncooked food, uh, according to everyone, have uncooked food that I'm stirring. 
According to some opinions, only uncooked food that's on the fire that I'm stirring. That everybody agrees is an Isoda writer. And from there we will have, there are those who say that if I take it off the fire, it's still going to be an Isoda. There are those who say the Korbo says, even if it's cooked, that it's going to, that it's going to be an Isoda of stirring. But the Korbo never said, however, the Korbo never said that if I take the food out, that that's an Isoda of stirring. There are Ma came along and there are Ma extended onto the Isoda of the Korbo and said, even if I take the food is fully cooked and it's off the fire, and I take it out with a spoon, and that's going to be a sword. But the Mishnah Bura said, "I can't. We're not going to go. We're not going to go that far. We're not going to be that stringent." So the the greatest stringency that we'll have is we'll say that to stir the food right while it's on the fire that we're going that we're going to avoid. The main question, the main point of contention, I said, was if the food is cooked and it's on the fire. Okay, so stirring, we said no. But can I remove it with a spoon? In that case, according to the Shulchan Aruch, yes. According to the Ramani Ashkenazim, the default position is no. But if there's a great need for it, then there is what to align, there's what to be lenient. And again, if it's a food that's not going to be, uh, you know, it's solid pieces, etc., that isn't going to be stirred anyway, then there's no there's no problem taking that taking that off. Okay, you can see uh, if you can make sense of this table that's on page sixty one that gives you a, a summary of uh, of uh, what we've discussed. But that is in terms of the sugya of. Uh, stirring. Okay, we have a little bit of time left. Let's move on to the next uh, next section, which is on page 77, which is Bishul Achar Afiyah. Now, we've already discussed, great length came up in today's show as well, the concept of Bishul Achar Bishul. And our, our, our basic point is to remind you, our, our uh, default position is, Ein Bishul Achar Bishul, meaning once a food has been cooked, I cannot cook it again. At least not on a on a derited level. We saw that there was a machloket regarding liquid and solid foods, and generally speaking, we try to be stringent. I'm not going to go into all the details again now, whether it's derited, whether it's derabanan, etc. But we try to be we are stringent regarding liquid foods that we say that if it's cooled down, we would consider it to be bishulach bishul, even though according to most of the rishonim, and we have to know but the Eved, that according to many of the rishonim, even with the liquid food, there is no bishulach bishul. Once it's been cooked, it's been cooked, and I cannot perform that melacha again. What if, however, as we said, there are different forms of cooking? There is cooking, there is roasting, there is baking, etc. So if a food has been baked, but it has not been cooked, or if a food has been roasted, but it has not been cooked, right, would that now add a level, and would that therefore be a Nisur, a Torah prohibition of Bishul? So the source for this discussion is very, very interesting. The source comes from the Gemara Masech Psachim, relating to the Korban Pesach. The Korban Pesach, has to be roasted and not cooked. That is why nowadays, so there are different minagim, nowadays generally when it comes to Seder night, we don't want it to look like we are eating the Korban Pesach because you can't eat Kodshim outside of the Beit HaMikdash and therefore we have the minhag not to eat just roasted meat, right? We, we Either we have cook it or we cook it in sauce or whatever so that it's not done in the same way. There are communities where the minhag is dafka to have roasted meat so that it should be, so, so, so that it should be, so that it's, you know, as a zeich in the Korban Pesach. Okay. So uh, whatever you do, you've got you, you've got you've got a, you've got a, you've got a midnight to line. But uh, so the question over here is, what happens if you after you've roasted the korban? What happens if you then come along and you would cook it, you would boil it, right? Is that sort of undoing the roast, or is that adding? Is that whether we say again we can get it to the lambdas, but whether we are undoing the roasting or whether adding to the roasting, it's, it's being cooked in a different form than than it has to be, and that would. The implication of that would be that there is such a thing as cooking after roasting. I'm doing a different, performing a different form of cooking. So the Gemara, yeah, according to Rabbi Yossi, comes to the conclusion that this would not be allowed. Um, okay, that's in source number one. Again, our division of the Shirim is not exactly the same as the way it's split up in the book. That's why the sources goes back to number one. But and and really, where he learns it from, he learns it from a case of matzah. Right, if you have a look at the second paragraph in source number one, so the Marav Kana, Amani Rabbi Yossi, the Tanya, Yotz in Berakik Hasharui, Umuvushal Shiloni Moach, the very Rabbi Meir, Rabbi Yossi, Amani Yotz in Berakik Hasharui, Avalo Mimuvushal, Afopi Shiloni Moach. In other words, if I have, um, if I have matzah which has been baked and then afterwards it gets cooked, right, it gets, uh, gets boiled, etc., then it loses this, it, it's not, it's no longer qualifies. As a uh, as a uh, matzah anymore. What point? What comes out from this? You can have a look at uh, at Rashi. Rashi source number two over the page. He says once it's boiled, it's no longer considered uh, no longer considered bread, no longer considered matzah. So the lechem karinan 
You could say there's no cooking after cooking. I've already baked it. I've already baked the matzah. And that's what it is. No. Once you had originally baked it, but then you came and cooked it. So it loses its original status. And he says the same thing by the Korban Pesach as well. So now the question is as follows. According to this Gemara, there is certainly a concept of Bishur L'Cha'afiya or, right, relating to the specific mitzvah of Korban Pesach. Relating to a specific mitzvah of matzah. Can I now extrapolate that concept and say that that would apply across the board? That would apply to Ilkhot Shabbat as well? Or do I say no, that it's something specific over there because there has to be a certain taste of the matzah, there has to be a certain taste or a certain method of the Korban Pesach. And therefore, there, another form of cooking would change its status. But when it comes to, I'll give you another example. When, when I talk about Bishul Bishu, I think we mentioned this but the first time we spoke about Bishul Bishu. We have Ilkhot Bishu when it comes to Shabbat. We have a chot bishu when it comes to isur v'heter, when it comes to kashrut. We have a chot bishu when it comes to basar b'chalav, right? So even although we say we say ain mishon achav bishu when it comes to Shabbat, we certainly aren't going to say that when it comes to basar b'chalav, right? Meat and milk on a Torah level are only going to be forbidden when the meat and the milk are have been cooked together when it's derech bishu. Midra banan, you still may not eat a cheeseburger, but it's possible. But it's possible that a cheeseburger is not actually an Isodoraita, but it's only an Isodorabana. But, because it's not cooked, okay? But, the fact is that when it's cooked together, certainly that is an Isodorite. So if I say, Ain bishurach habishos, okay, I have my meat which I've cooked, right? I have my milk which I've cooked. I say, well, for Shabbat, we said, Ain bishurach habishos. So from the Torah, I can now go and I can take the meat which is cooked and cook it in a milk sauce. Of course you can't say that, right? There, because it's, it's a different... So, so always the question is, so the fact that the Gemara here learns that for Korban Pesach and for Matzah, there is such a concept of Bishul HaTarafiyah. Does that translate into a Chot Shabbat? Maybe yes, maybe no, not necessarily. So here we have a machloket, tremendous machloket Rishonim. We have, again, the Sefer Yireim. Sefer Yireim, Rabbi Eliezer Mimitz. Rabbi Mimitz is one of the famous uh, Rishonim. He wrote the book Sefer Yireim, again, which he, we've quoted before uh, in Chot Shabbat. But he goes through, he's one of the Monaya Mitzvot. He goes through and he calculates where we have the 613 uh, mitzvot from, right? And he, and he writes through that in, in Sefer Yerim. So he says, when it comes to cooking, he says the following in source number three. He says, Okay, without getting into all the details, but he says our, our, our starting point, our default is, and once the food has already been cooked, right? It's 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 cooked. Now in bold he says aval yesh bishul achad sli, v'yesh sli achad bishul. All that where it's the same form of cooking, but if there's a different form of cooking like roasting, he says there is such a concept of bishul achad sli, or there is such a concept of sli achad bishul. And therefore, if I've already cooked my food and I now come and roast it, there's going to be niso the writer of bishul, and same thing, same thing, um, vice versa. This okay. would be the source for the broth. This would be the source for for the broth. Uh, it's the truth is that it's based on it's no, based on, on, on the Sogi and the Gemara. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's slightly different. The source for the broth. That's got to do that. That's got to do there with the question of whether when when something becomes chametz and whether it can become chametz once it's already been cooked or when when it's soaked already. But it is related to so it. Like like I realize that's not the sugar, and they're talking about that particular thing. He does say she had seen if it was showing anyone, anyway, but she wouldn't say that. You're saying if you're 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 seen, you wouldn't be able to your seen if it was coming. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, okay, but essentially that is the that is the that is the approach of the Sefer Yerayim. On the other hand, we have the Ra'avya. If you turn over the page, page eighty, source number five. I always had a question. And this is like Misora, Yekish, I'm 100 percent Yeah. So my mother, she had matzah on Pesach, and she was going to make a matzah kuba. She told me once she add the water, the matzah, hurry up, hurry up, hurry up. You don't want it to become chametz. I didn't make this up. I mean, why? What was the what was the Misora that she was? I saw. What was? What so, was that about? So again, it's not directly. I came from my grandmother and my great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So again, so, so again, it's not directly our sugya now. It is somewhat related. Like, the point is this: the Gemara tells us that from the time you add water to flour within a certain period of time, which we generally make to say is eighteen minutes, right? But uh, for the, the certain. Was baked, and then they add water to. 
Right. So this whole idea of gabroch, or so or whatever. So the Gemara does say that once the food has been, once the flour, once it's been cooked, right, once it's been baked, it's not going to become chametz. But essentially, there's a concern that there may be parts which were not, which were not fully cooked, right? So you have the flour that's still there, and that, but which was not, and that could still, that could still become chametz. That's essentially, that's essentially what it's based on. Okay. So, but, but let's just see this machlok. We'll read the shulchan aruch, and they will end for today. Next time, we'll pick it up. With some more Bishul Acharafiyah and Bishul Achatzli. So the Uraim is the one. He writes here Bishul Achatzli, Avalayna Chinami. It could, it could be Sli, it could be roasting, it could be baking, it could be, right, different forms of cooking. The Ravya is the one who comes out against him. Source number five on page 80. The Ravya says, Shamati Marabenu Eliezer Mimitz. And this is the proof now you know that the Ravya did not just write about Haseva and Pesach. He actually wrote others for him and he has other, other Pesach as well. But he says, Shamati Marabenu Eliezer Mimitz. So interesting, here he says it, the Ravia says, I heard from the Yerayim that cooking after baking and baking after cooking is a prohibition, etc. Next paragraph, he says, He says he doesn't know what he's talking about. He says, forget about it. He's, uh, he's completely incorrect. This is exactly the argument that we're saying. We have explicit Gemarot which tell us that for certain in Yanim there is such a thing as Bishul Acharfiyah, Bishul Acharfiyah. But says the Ravya, who says it's got anything to do with Shabbat? That's got to do with Pesach. And on Pesach, you need the taste of matzah. And matzah has been baked. And then you're going to go boil it. It doesn't taste like matzah anymore. It tastes like a broth, right? It's not, the, it's not the same. And therefore, and therefore, he says, when it comes to Shabbat, and the no, we have the regular uh, uh, rule that we know, and that's enough. Shulchan Aruch, source number six, says, Yesh mi shomer. Okay, the whole thing is going to be a lot of confusion here with the Shulchan Aruch. The whole thing starts with Yesh mi shomer. We know we're in trouble. Right? But he says, there are those who say, Okay, who is that? That's the opinion of. Not a true question, no. right? There is says the Shulchan Aruch. There is an opinion that says once something has been baked or roasted and then I cook it or vice versa, then I have the concept that that is a problem of Bishul. That's the opinion of the Uraim. exactly, right? So that is one opinion. And then he says, um, right, and based on that, he would say asuri ten pat afilu bekli sheni shayad soledet bo. Okay, he says based on that. Now we're going to have a problem. Now, it gets confusing because he mixes in a few different things. The Shogun Aruch here is not just talking about Bishul HaRafiyah. He also starts talking about Kli Sheni, which we've seen already is, a, is, a, is, a, is Machloket. So this is where things are going to get very complicated. But never mind. And then he says, the Yesh Matirin, and there are those who permit it. And that is the opinion of? The Ravya, right? Uh, Yafe. So those are the two different opinions. Now, when we have in the Shogun Aruch, we have Yesh the Yesh. He brings two opinions and begins both with Yesh. We we hold like which opinion? The second one. The second one. Again, source number six. It starts off the first word is Yesh Mishomer, and the last two words are Yesh material. So it's Yesh for Yesh. So generally speaking, according to Klalapsika, we go by the second opinion. And therefore, it would seem to be the Shukhan Rukhaviya is maker in terms of Bishurakhafiya. The problem is. Problem is, it's not 100% clear when the Shulchan Aruch writes Yesh Matirin, what's he referring to? Is he referring to the whole thing? Or is he referring only to the part about Klishe Ni? Okay, we'll see. We'll talk about that next week. And then the Ramah comes along and says, Nagula Zela Katrila, Shloit Litain Pata, Filu Beklishe Ni, because Mancha Shayat Zolel Bor. Keragil. The Ramah says, No, the Shulchan Aruch is Maker, but we are Machmer. Okay, so we have to talk about, we have to see uh, again. It's, it's a little bit more. Uh, more complex than we have time to go into now. So we'll stop that. We'll stop over there. We'll pick it up, Ezra Hashem, on this next week. Bishulach Harfiyah, Bishulach Harsli, etc. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Good to be back. Have a wonderful week, wonderful month, wonderful year, and uh, all the best.